Welcome to the next video in the search for better health topic. This video is going to be looking at syllabus.9.4.4. Identified defense adaptations including the infl inflammation response, phagocytosis, the lymph system and cell death to seal off pathogens. So again, it's an identified dot point. So we really just need to know what happens in each of the, these four uh, processes and why they take place. So up until now, we've been looking at the first line of defense. So how do we stop pathogens from getting into the body? Now, what happens if the first line of defense fails? We need a second line of defense. So the second line of defense includes these four things that we're going to look at in this video. And just like the first line of defense, it's a non-specific defense mechanism. So it will basically uh, attack any pathogen that enters the body in order to stop it from reaching the point where it's able to cause symptoms of the particular disease that it causes. So let's start off with the inflammation response. No doubt everybody's either cut themselves or knocked themselves quite badly and ended up with an area of their body that's swollen, got red and got warm. So that's basically the inflammation response. So when there is an infection or damage to a part of the body, what happens is the circulatory system redirects blood to that site. The reason why is the blood carries clotting factors that help to prevent the pathogens from circulating around the body. So by forming little clots on either side of the damaged uh, part of the body, it traps those pathogens and stops them from moving to the rest of the circulatory system. The blood also carry phagocytes, um, which are white blood cells that are necessary for the destruction of pathogens. And the blood also helps to transfer heat. So our blood is a really good heat conductor. So when we're cold, that's why we want to make sure that we keep our extremities covered, okay, because our heat is quite, uh, sorry, the heat from our body is really easy, can really easily escape because it moves so, um, moves around in our blood so well. So the reason why blood transfers heat to the area of infection is that pathogens struggle to survive, in particular bacteria, with a temperature increase. So damage to the tissues release chemicals known as chemokines that trigger the production of a specific chemical called histamines, which dilate blood capillaries, so they make them bigger, to increase blood flow, as well as increasing their permeability to allow fluid and phagocytes to enter tissues. So what happens is, these histamines are released, the blood capillaries get bigger, and they also allow substances to move in and out of them much more freely, which is that permeability. If we have a situation where too much histamine is being produced, so people that have allergic reactions or people that suffer from hay fever can take antihistamine tablets in order to try to neutralize that histamine produced and stop that redness of your eyes and your nose and that um, that sneezing and the, uh, the runny nose and the runny eyes because all of that's related to the histamine that's produced when we have an inflammatory response. So this diagram here goes through the steps of what happens after a splinter enters our finger. So as we can see, once the splinter has entered our finger, these little bits here are the pathogens that were on the wood for that splinter. So bacteria and viruses are able to gain access to our body and what happens is our body initiates the inflammatory response in order to try to combat these particular pathogens. So the first thing that happens is that once the tissue has been damaged following invasion by a pathogen, the chemical histamine is released into the, into the blood. So the histamine causes the dilation or the opening of the blood vessels. And as we said, the increased permeability of the blood vessel walls. And as a result, swelling takes place. So you can imagine if we've got more blood flowing to the particular area and then that blood's able to leave the capillary and enter the tissue, then that tissue is obviously filling with blood and taking up more space. Other chemicals are released that attract phagocytes. So our phagocytes are a type of white blood cell that help to eat up the bacteria, so like these guys here. So we can see the pathogens are being engulfed by this purple phagocyte here. So the increased blood flow also brings more oxygen, which the cells need to carry out respiration in order to get the energy that they need to repair. 
It also carries platelets, which are the cell fragments that help the blood to clot, and other white blood cells, which help to stimulate the healing process. So as a result of all these things, the area becomes red, obviously from more blood. Hot, as we said, blood carries more heat. Swollen, because we've got excess fluid in the area. It can get, become painful because the uh, tissues are now pushing against the pain receptors under our skin and often immobile. So if it's swollen, the joints become impacted and depending on where the um, inflammation is, it can make it hard for that part of the body to move. So the increase in heat also helps to suppress the bacterial growth, as we mentioned. So the second process is phagocytosis. So again, another non-specific process where phagocytes attack all foreign substances and engulf and destroy them. So because it's non-specific, it doesn't matter what pathogen's trying to get in, the phagocytes will just attack them and try to eat them up to stop them from being able to travel around the body. The big problem is, is phagocytosis is not always successful as some pathogens are able to repel phagocytes and then we obviously need to move into our third line of defense. When you have an infected part of your body that produces pus or pimples and things, that is actually a mixture of dead phagocytes plus the bacteria that they've ingested and surrounding tissue fluid and blood cells that have been damaged by, uh, sorry, body cells that have been damaged by that tissue. So that's why if you have pimples or um, scabs or infected parts of your body that um, are releasing pus, you should never touch them and then touch another part of your body or touch somebody else because you can be transferring those pathogens from place to place. So phagocytosis is carried out by a particular type of white blood cells called macrophages. So these are large phagocytic, phagocytic sorry, cells that are mobile, so they're able to move. They live for quite a long time and they're mononucleated, so they have one nucleus. And what they actually do is they extend these pseudopodia. So pseudo means fake, podia means feet. So it's like they stretch their arms out and they engulf any damaged or dead cells, any debris, any microbes that are coated with antibodies or any damaged fatty particles. And then they bring them in, create a vacuole inside themselves and then destroy those foreign bits and pieces. So this just shows a little bit of a, a really basic flow chart of how it works. So the yellow structure would be our macrophage and our red, our red little thing here is our food, a food particle, which could be a pathogen of any description. So what happens is these pseudopodia are extended. So the plasma membrane pushes out and surrounds our pathogen. Then we have a vacuole being formed around the pathogen and it traps it inside the phagocyte or the macrophage. So then these little green circles here are known as lysosomes. And these lysosomes attach themselves to the outside of the vacuole. And what they do is they release enzymes, which are chemicals that help to digest the, phag uh, the pathogen into the vacuole. And basically the, ma uh, the macrophage then ingests the pathogen into it. Okay. And, and it's now, the pathogen is now rendered useless and cannot cause any symptoms. The next one is the lymph system. So we've talked a little bit about what the lymph system is in comparison to the circulatory system. So this is just going on now to have a look at how the lymph system specifically helps in the second line of defense. So the lymph system is a system of vessels and lymph nodes that runs parallel to the circulatory system. It controls tissue fluid balance. So um, if you have a swelling in a particular area that's not related to inflammation due to infection, it's because the lymph system's not particularly working well in that area. Also lipid transport, so fat transport, and obviously defense against disease. So the lymph itself is a colorless fluid that drains from the interstitial spaces into the lymph capillaries. So the interstitial interstitial spaces are the spaces in between the cells. So all our cells are bathed with a fluid, which is known as interstitial fluid, and that drains into our lymph capillaries, and then it moves around the body through the contraction of our muscles. So we don't, our heart doesn't pump the lymph. The contraction and the movement of our muscles helps to move the lymph around the body. The other part of the lymphatic system which is important are our lymph nodes. 
So these act as filters to remove microbes or foreign particles, also tissue debris or dead cells from circulation. And our lymph nodes also help to produce lymphocytes, which are white blood cells which are important for the fight against diseases. So this here shows what the lymph system looks like, quite simplified. Okay, so unlike the circulatory system, we don't have our arteries that carry oxygenated blood away from the heart and our veins that carry our deoxygenated blood back to the heart. We just have one branching system of uh, vessels that helps to carry the lymph from uh, one place to another. So all of those green lines there represent our lymph vessels. Okay, the thymus is an important organ in the lymph system. Okay, so we'll be looking at that in relation to the production and the maturity of the different types of lymphocytes when we look at the immune response. The same with the spleen. The spleen is necessary to help us fight infection. You can live without your spleen. However, you need to make sure that you take precautions and don't come in contact with infectious diseases. And lastly, our lymph nodes, which are those little um, darker spots throughout the lymphatic system concentrated in the neck, armpits, chest, stomach and groin which are the areas where those lymphocytes are held and the main sites of helping with uh, the fight against infectious diseases. So the last thing that we need to look at in the second line of defense is the cell death to seal off pathogens. So what can happen if a pathogen gets in is that a cluster of cells may surround that pathogen and any damaged tissue that's associated with that pathogen. What actually happens there is the area becomes sealed off with other cells, such as white blood cells, and healthy cells possibly sacrificing themselves to make sure that that pathogen is trapped in that particular area so it doesn't travel through the circulatory system and cause problems in other parts of the body. So a cyst or a tough lump may even form under the surface of the skin in an attempt to contain the pathogen. So a particular example of this are pimples. So as we said before, pimples are a concoction of oils and dead, uh, dead, skin, uh, sorry, dead skin cells, bacteria all mushed together and then held under the surface of the skin. Sometimes cysts can be quite a bit tougher, okay, and they may need to be uh, removed surgically. Okay, so some cysts can disappear naturally, so the body will absorb it or the body will get rid of it naturally. And if not, um, a simple surgical procedure where a few local anesthetics are given around the, the site and then a small incision is made and then the cyst is removed. So by doing it that way, by removing the cyst surgically, you're obviously taking all those um, pathogenic cells and those dead skin cells and those bits and pieces that aren't really helpful anymore with the cyst and therefore returning the body to its healthy state. And that brings us to the end of this video. So thank you for watching.